Goedemorgen allemaal, welkom bij Kerk. Ons is bij Pas Vrijdag. Hier is mijn vriend Gabriel. En uh, hij gaat voor ons spreken vandaag en zondag. So, uh, ons is om een uh, veel uh, voorstel aan hem. Hij is een oude vriend van mij. Hij was pastoor hier in, in Potsu Stroom. En hij heeft nu een uh, bediening gepland met de naam Fire en Vrijkens. Gaan kijken alsjeblieft naar alle goed online. Hulle doen amazing prayer, worship en missions. Um, recht oor Zuid-Afrika. So ons is baie opgewonden om te hee as gastspreker volgende. Ik hoop jullie geniet het. Kom ons geef vir my handenklap daar in die sitkamer net op waar jullie sit. Um, thanks Gabriel. Thanks Gilly. Ja so, allemaal, ek wil net vannacht morgen sê en ietsie klein vannacht verduidelik Gilly, dankie so baie. Het is so groot voorrecht vir my om saam met allemaal te wees um, vir ochend op goeie vrijdag. Maar ek gaan Oor 10 secondes gaan ek oorschokkel Engels toe, en Gilly weet hierdie vir my, ek denk dit is iets dat ek rarig al rikter gevoel die heren sê vir my, um, is om te communikeren in manier dat een groter audience van mense van ons kan bereik met wat ek voel die heren wil sê. So, yeah guys, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time or whatever time it is that you will be reading this, um, it's such a privilege for me to come and share with you guys um, on, on Good Friday. I think today is such a special day for us as Christians, because this is what separates our religion from any other. This is what separates what we believe from any other religion. This, this day of the crucifixion of our God is what makes this unique of what we believe. And um, I want to pray for us, and then we're going to get going. So Jesus, thank you so much just for this opportunity to all gather, Lord, wherever we are, all around South Africa, all over the world, um, listening on the screen. Jesus, I thank you that as families, as households, as friends, we can be together and just celebrate what you have done for us. God, I thank you. I thank you for what you have done for us. Lord, we, we just pray, Holy Spirit, you reveal the truth of what happened on that cross to all of us. That it will be real, that it won't just be a figment of our imagination, it won't be a good theological concept but the truth of the cross will be made manifest in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, so as I'm here, as, I am, I, as I'm sharing with you guys, I felt in prayer after he spoke to me that um, the best way for me to, to communicate the cross is to communicate the gospel. And um, I think there's so many times where we have, we have been taught so many things about, about the gospel, what it is, what it's not, that as Christians in church, we have lost the understanding of the power that it has. And I want to start with the, with the scriptures, Romans 1 verse 16. And it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith through faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And, I, and I, I love this piece of scripture, um, and I'm just going to unpack it a little bit before we go on, but here Paul wrote, writes to the Roman church, and he says to them, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And he is communicating to a people here that, that this gospel, this message, the gospel means a proclamation, a message, means good news that has been proclaimed. This gospel, I am not ashamed of it. And then he, he gives the reasons why. He says, because I'm, it is the power of God that brings salvation. So, Paul qualifies why he is not ashamed of this good news. And the reason he's not ashamed is because it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, that word power that we read there, and you can underline or um, circle that word power and write next to it or in your notebook, that word power is the word dunamis. Right? And, and if you would imagine what other word sounds like dunamis, right? It's dynamite, right? And I, I, I love this idea how, how Paul is communicating. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, because it is the dunamis of God that brings salvation to everyone. It is the dynamite power of God that brings salvation to everyone. And and I think the reason I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming and kind of talking about this is because a lot of times in our Christian walk, the gospel is something you hear Jesus talks about it has no effect on your life. That is not the gospel. 
That, that is not the message that Paul is preaching. That is not the message that the, that the apostles brought. That is not the message that Jesus himself proclaimed, right? It, the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus is dynamite power unto salvation. It is dynamite power from darkness to light. It is dynamite power from bondage to freedom. It is dynamite power from shame to living a life in freedom and transparency. And I, I just believe as we're standing here, I'm standing here and you guys are sitting or standing wherever you are, on this Good Friday, we need to understand that what happened on the cross 2,000 years ago was not just a good concept. It actually carries power to change everything about us. And, and I, I remember my own personal story in my life. I grew up in church. I've, I've heard the story a thousand times over, and, 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 and I didn't really understand what it meant to me. And so what I'm going to do the rest of our time together is I want to unpack the simplicity of the gospel. And I want to unpack what it means for all of us and how we enter in to this dunamis lifestyle, this lifestyle of power, right? And it is not just power in the sense of, oh, I pray and things happen to people, or um, I experience necessarily something in my own personal devotion. This power, as is described right here, as is understood in a New Testament context, is the grace of God, the Holy Spirit in our lives that makes us into the image bearers God created us to be. It is not just power for miracles. It's not just power for evangelism, although it's all those things. It's also power to look at yourself in the mirror and actually think that you're beautiful. It's also power that wakes up in the morning in the midst of all the chaos we have about this virus and not feel anxiety. It's, and, and it's not maybe even not feeling anxiety. It's in the midst of anxiety going like, Jesus, you have given me the power to overcome the dunamis, Thank you, Holy Spirit, that I can rely on the truth of the Word. And boom, that power comes into our lives and it resurrects what fear has caused to die in our hearts. And so I just want to kind of unpack this in a simple way. So um, I want to, I'm going to go through five simple things about the simple gospel. Number one thing that the simple gospel communicates, and, and, and this is so important because in, in, in our current day and age, what I'm going to share right now is mega taboo, right? And the first step of understanding the power of the gospel is this, that we all are sinners by nature. And Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, not some, not just the bad person that's in jail, even the best person on the planet that lives a moral good life has fallen short of God's glory. And I think that what happens, what we do is we go like, well, I look at my life and I go like, at least I'm not like this person. At least I'm not like that person. Well, heaven's accusation or heaven's account is, well, you're not like Jesus. And the, 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 the measurement stick is that do you live on par with the holiness of God? Do you live on par with the perfection of God? And if the answer is no, even with 0,01%, you have fallen short. You are a sinner and you deserve the wrath of God. And I think that once we understand that and we have a revelation of that, it causes desperation in our heart. It causes something in my heart to go like, I'm looking in the world around me, realizing nobody can save themselves. Realizing with the brokenness that we see, this makes sense, right? So that's the first step, is understanding we all have fallen short. Everybody, from the best person you know to the worst person you've ever read about, all of us are equally sinners in the sight of God. I love where the Bible speaks about and it says that there's no greater sin than another. All sin is sin before God. And I think that what that does to some of our religious thinking is that when I think that, well, I only struggle with a little bit of insecurity. Luckily, I don't use tons of drugs. God never has that conversation with you. He goes like, you have fallen short and you've missed the mark. But praise God for what happens next. And this is the second thing I want to talk about. 
we have received eternal life as a free gift. So first what happens is that we realize that all have fallen short, all have, have been in the place of I do not make it, right? And in the revelation of I have fallen short of God's perfection, he goes like, wait, but if you put all your belief, if you put all your faith in Jesus, salvation is a free gift. Now, what does that mean? It means that you cannot work for it. It means that you cannot earn it. You cannot make it happen. Why? Because if you can make it happen, you could save yourself. And no man outside of the man Jesus has had the ability to live a sinless life on this earth right now. And we read in Romans how it speaks about Jesus being a second Adam and how he lived the perfect life that the first Adam could not live so that at one man's sacrifice, all of mankind's sins might be wiped away. And I believe that this is the second point that we need to understand, that none of my good work, none of the things that I try to do could ever save me. But salvation that I receive from God is a free gift. It is a free gift. Ephesians says that salvation is a free gift, Ephesians 2, so that no man might boast. There is no boasting in the cross. We can only boast in Jesus. There's nothing that we can boast about in ourselves. The best way I can explain kind of what, I, what, what this means to us is all of us have met like these young 20-some-year-old guys, um, and they're like driving, racing around with their brand-new double-cab Hilux Bucky or truck, right? And you know, right, that their dad bought that truck for them. They did not pay for that thing themselves, right? And, and, and they're sitting in the truck, and they look like they're mega important just because they drive in this truck. That's kind of what happens with Christians if they show off their salvation and think that they did it. It's kind of the same feeling as a young guy that think he is super important because his dad bought him a truck. It's the same feeling like Christians think that, oh, I did this to myself but it's actually a Father's free gift that gave this to us. So that's the second point. So first point, quickly the overview, is that we all have fallen short. Second point is that salvation is a free gift. We cannot work for it. The third point is this, and I love this. I'm going to read this. It's Romans 5 verse 8. It says, But God demonstrated His own love for us in this, that while yet we were sinners, He died for us. And This is mind-blowing. That in your deepest moment of shame, in your deepest, darkest thought, if you can imagine the most horrible thing you have ever done, in the midst of that moment, Jesus looked at you and He said, you're worth it. I I choose you. I choose you. You are the one I will give my life for. And as as He hung on that cross, and, and, and he bled out as he was pierced and nailed there. His thought was to save you in the midst of your darkness. And what this does to, to our understanding of the gospel and the power that it communicates is that Jesus knew we didn't make it. He didn't like when you sin all of a sudden go like, oh, I'm so surprised Gabriel sinned. No, God sees everything. He's in the midst of everything and in the midst of that. He says, I choose you. I choose you in your brokenness. I choose you where you fall short. That is the good news. And I think that so many of us carry years of shame on us. We carry years of of, 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 of disqualifying ourselves from God's love. While the Bible communicates already, that's why you should read the book. Read the Bible, guys. It will change you. Romans yells almost at you. I chose you in your weakness. I chose you where you have fallen short. I've chosen you in every area where you have disqualified you. I still chose you. And I think it's so beautiful. That is our God. The God that we serve is the one that looks at where we have fallen short. He says, I love you and I choose you. The fourth point is this now. Romans 10. And this is where the whole story turns. So, The first three steps says we have all fall short of God's glory, right? We cannot save ourselves as a free gift. And while you were 
broken. He saw you and he chose you. Now what now? And Romans 10 communicates and it says the following. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you shall be saved. And, and I, I, I love this. And sometimes we can just read this and skip over it. And go like, okay, Jesus, I confess your Lord. Thank you for salvation. That's, that's not this. This, this, commun- this is like 10 miles deep. Like this whole phrase right there could be a whole sermon on its own. What, what this communicates to us is that if, if you believe in your heart, now what is your heart? In biblical terms, the definition of heart, of what heart means, is, is it is the seat of ruling in your life. It is the seat, the sit black, of ruling in your life. It is like the throne of your life. So it says if you believe in your heart, Right, If you believe that he is the only one perfect enough, good enough to rule you, and you realize that in the deepest parts of you, and you confess it with your mouth, right, that he is Lord, you will be saved. Now, what does that word Lord mean? Right? Jesus is the Savior of the world, but he only saves those that call him Lord. He has given access to his salvation to all mankind on the cross. But the ones who access it is the ones that call him Lord. And this word Lord is the same word as king. It is that you are above all things. In my heart, in the seat of ruling, in this throne of my life, I declare right now, Jesus, that you are king. That you are king above my dreams, that you are king above my hopes, that you are king above my circumstances, that you are king above my relationships. And if if you are at that place, if you have become so aware of your sinfulness, if you have become aware that you cannot save yourself, if you realize that He chose you in your darkness, and you look at that and go like, oh, the only one found worthy is Jesus to rule me, not me, there's a promise, you shall be saved. And I think a lot of times the reason that we do not experience the dunamis, the dynamite power of the gospel, is because we've watered down the gospel to close your eyes and raise your hands if you want to get saved. That is nowhere to be found in Scripture. There is not a New Testament model for Christianity that is heads bowed and eyes closed. New Testament Christianity is a radical yes in the midst of persecution to follow a man who has overcome death and wants to impart that same life to us. And so as we are gathering here at, on Good Friday, I believe today, 2,000-something years later, the gospel is still good news. It is still good news. It is still that message that saves us. But it does not just save us. It keeps on saving us. We read how it says in Scripture that work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean, right? That means that every single day I still need to apply the gospel. I still need to apply what the gospel does in my life. I still need to apply God's saving grace to my life, right? That the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. He keeps on making us holy. Afrikaans word for sanctify is heilig maken. Okay, He keeps on making us more like Jesus. And I just want to encourage you guys as we're gathering here on this Good Friday looking at Jesus for the following. That the gospel has still got power. It can still change. It did not just do it to your radical friend that used to be a drug addict. It didn't just do it to that person's story you've watched on Facebook or Instagram. It can change you. It can radically change change your life. It can radically change your quiet time. It can radically change the way that you see yourself. But the question you need to ask yourself, is the gospel you believe the true one? Is it the real story of what God did on the cross? So as I'm ending this morning, I want to pray for us. And I just, you can just put your hand on your heart. And I want to pray that there will be a revelation today as you're sitting together with family or friends of this gospel message. 
that this message has power to transform you from darkness to light, from a sinner to saint, that he wants to completely, completely and utterly save you. So Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. Jesus, that you have chosen us while yet we were sinners, that in our deepest moments of darkness, that you have saved us. God, and we just choose today, we choose today, God, to look at what your word says about the gospel, what your word says is true about this power that we have received. And we're going to say, Jesus, thank you, and we receive it. God, we want to align ourselves with what your word says and say, Lord, you are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy, that you are the only one that has been found perfect to take our place in Jesus' name. And I just want to say, if, if you're home and you are like um, sitting there and you realize that you're not born again, that you know that you know that you are not saved, turn to the people next to you and say, hey, pray for me. Pray for me that I would meet him. And, and, and it's simple. It says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you will be saved. So maybe turn to the people next to you. I believe there are people who are going to get born again today. And say to them, hey, I honestly don't think I'm saved. I want to make Jesus Lord. I want to make him king. And then the first thing you do is you go like, Lord, save me. I declare you king over everything. And then with the people around you, confess those things that you've made king above Jesus. And I believe that he is faithful to save us. It says in Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. Not some. Everyone. If you call on the name of the Lord, king, if you call him king, you've made that decision hard as a promise he will save you. So bless you guys. Have an amazing time. Thank you.